Great. Should I go ahead and start? Please. Excellent. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot to the organizers for putting this together. And, and thanks for, yeah, all of you. There's yeah, quite a lot of people who've shown up, and that's very nice of you. <laughs> so, um, let me start sharing my screen. As mentioned, I'm Raghu Parthasarathy. I'm in the physics department at the University of Oregon. Good. Uh, can you see my sharing is working? It's, it's working well. Excellent. Yeah, please go ahead. Great, yeah, I'm in the physics department at the University of Oregon. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the things that my group has been doing, looking at essentially the biophysics of the gut microbiome. And um, before starting, actually, I was kind of curious who, who you all are. Um, so I put up just a couple of quick poll questions to try to uh, mainly for my own curiosity, but you can, um, I think I can start the poll. Oh, good, the poll is already there. You can write down where you're from. Um, and you have continental options there, and I'll just keep it up for a couple of seconds. And three, oh, I'll wait a couple more seconds because people are still clicking. Apologies to the Antarcticans for not writing them out explicitly there. Good, three, two, one, stop. If you're curious, here's the results. So about three quarters from North America, eh, but, but a pretty broad, broad spread. And then, the next question, which hopefully you can see over there, it says, who are you? Um, and again, a few different options there. So undergraduate, graduate student, postdoc or research scientist, faculty or other. And you guys are all quicker at clicking now, so I'll just go another couple of seconds. Three, two, one, stop. And we can share that one. I don't know why DU is highlighted, um, but uh, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's a pretty even spread between grad students, postdocs, and faculty. Cool, well, thank you. So, continuing onwards. Um, so these days, probably this entire audience and, and even much of the general public is aware that each of us is actually an entire ecosystem, not just a human, but a human together with lots and lots of microbes, mainly bacteria. And um, you know, trillions and trillions of these. In fact, you have probably at least as many bacterial cells in your body as human cells. And um, you don't just have a large number, but you have a lot of different species, a large amount of variation, both um, between people and uh, even within people over time. So we've known this for a while, but it's really um, you know, come to the forefront of a lot of our attention because we increasingly realize that these animal-associated microbes do a lot. Um, they do a lot in things that aren't very surprising, like they play roles in digestion and things like that, but they do a lot also for quite, um, quite surprising things. They play a large role in governing how the immune system works. They're involved in things like the early, develop early development of various organs, and they play uh, important and often quite puzzling roles in a lot of diseases, especially quite complex diseases like diabetes and even various neurological orders, as well as resistance to pathogens. So we have these huge communities of gut microbes. They do quite a lot. And so this has attracted a lot of attention, but it, it's still remarkably poorly understood how this whole ecosystem and how this whole kind of virtual organ actually behaves and what determines how it behaves. So some very basic questions about the animal-associated microbiome are extremely murky. Like what determines the composition of these gut microbial communities? What is it that sets what species are present in, in a healthy person versus what species are present in someone with, with diabetes? And the kind of proactive version of this, how can we alter these community compositions, changing what species are present or the relative abundances of different species? Now, this is a, an extremely difficult and very, very, very messy topic. Um, not only are these questions not well understood, but there's you know, very contradictory um, you know, pushes in different directions to try to, try to get, get at them. So it's a difficult and, and quite messy topic. So one might wonder, especially in an audience like this, can biophysics help make sense of all this? So that's the approach that my, or that's the question my, that my group quite broadly has been looking at. And here's a picture of my group from, um, I think this one was two years ago or so. And I put it up for two reasons. One, to acknowledge a really wonderful group that's done uh, a lot of just um, intrepid work. But also this picture is taken on the, um, the rocky, beautiful Oregon coast. And if I panned the camera you know, a bit to the left and down, you'd see these you know, corrugated rocky tide pools and they would be filled with starfish and sea urchins and all kinds of creatures there. 
And if somebody came to you and said that they would, tr they would explain to you how the tide, tide, tidal pool ecosystem works um, without any knowledge whatsoever that it's a rocky surface, that the tides come in and out twice a day, that starfish crawl around but mussels stay put, that the sea lions come in at high tide, all they were going to do is just take swabs and swab off the DNA and sequence it and from that determine how the ecosystem works. You would say that that's completely bizarre, that's completely nuts. Um, because we know from macroscopic e ecosystems, it's almost self-evident that understanding how these work requires understanding the physical environment and how organisms interact with the physical environment. This perspective, though, is actually very, um, very much not applied to the microbiome, in part because of necessity. So the little cartoon example I gave of swabbing DNA off the rocks is actually how nearly all of what we know about the gut microbiome uh, is derived. So nearly all gut microbiome studies come from taking things like fecal samples and doing DNA or related sequencing and getting from that a list of species or genes. Now this is immensely powerful. You get these lists of species and genes and can often say things about uh, constituents and function and so on, but there's an enormous amount missing, especially things about spatial organization, uh, physical environment, and so on. So as a consequence, we know almost nothing about structure and dynamics of these gut microbial communities. So very basic kind of biophysical questions like, um, are there spatial niches that allow these hundreds of different species that you have within your gut to coexist? Um, do, do they play a role? What are the timescales? In fact, you know, we were talking about timescales in, in, in the last talk, which is beautiful. In this system as well, what are the timescales for fluctuations and responses to, per to perturbations, whether those are introductions of new species or changes in diet or drugs or all kinds of things? Can we think of the nucleation and growth of bacterial colonies in the ways that we do for other uh, abiotic systems? So these are, as I said, kind of biophysical questions. And so to tackle them, what we've decided to do is take an approach that's been very powerful in biophysics in general. And that is to find a good model system that allows controlled experiments, and also to think of a way to actually look at it, to image it. So our model system is um, the zebrafish. And these are a very popular model throughout um, life sciences for a bunch of, of uh, usual or well-known reasons. They're vertebrates, so they're physiologically similar, similar to, to you and me. Uh, they're genetically tractable. And at young ages, like the larva, which is what we work on, they're quite transparent. So here's a larval zebrafish. The scale bar is a quarter millimeter over here. Uh, we've just put a red dye into the gut just so you can see the gut here for illustration. Here's an adult zebrafish over here. In addition to these attributes, however, there's something else really great about zebrafish, which is that you can prepare them to be initially germ-free, that is devoid of any microbes. And then you can add in, just to the water around them, particular species and um, particular species, and therefore do experiments in which composition or initial compositions and timings are controlled. And these germ-free techniques were especially developed by our local collaborator, Karen Gilliman, uh, at the University of Oregon. Uh, and now this is something that like, yeah, my students and many other people do, do quite routinely. So that's our model system, but how can we look at it? So I, I put this little cartoon up here. Uh, here's the petri dish, here's our intrepid scientist, I suppose this is me. Um, day 37, I finally earned the E. coli's trust. So we want to be this guy. So, you know, I just mentioned that the larval zebrafish are pretty transparent, but it's still the case that imaging is quite challenging. And that's because we want to look at a quite large field of view, hundreds of microns on a side uh, with single bacterium resolution, and we want to image that in 3D. What's more, we want to take those 3D images quite quickly because every minute or so, uh, we have another example of pulsatility. So here we're looking at, at the intestine and every minute or so we have the peristaltic contractions of the gut, which your guts are doing as well. So we need to be able to image on timescales that are faster than this, otherwise everything would just be blurred. What's more, we want to do, do this for many hours to look at the dynamics of the system. And so we want low uh, light-induced damage or, or, or toxicity. These are somewhat challenging constraints. And in fact, um, sort of conventional approaches like confocal microscopy are, are inadequate for this. So we turned to a technique called light sheet fluorescence microscopy. Um, and this was especially developed uh, in sort of the early 2000s, although it actually has a 100-year-old history, which is quite, quite fascinating. Um, 
and is developed especially by, by groups at uh, EMBL. Anyway, um, the basic idea is quite simple. You're doing fluorescence microscopy, but you shape your excitation into a thin sheet. So you're essentially ex exciting a plane in your sample. And your sample, in our case, is a larval zebrafish. I've indicated it by this little orb here. Then you image what's excited by your excitation with a second perpendicular lens um, oriented uh, as shown. And so at any instant, you're capturing one 2D slice. And then just by scanning in that one remaining dimension, you construct a three-dimensional image. So we've built a couple of these home-built setups. Um, and here's our, our kind of workhorse setup. setup. Here's the excitation lens. Here's the detection lens. And you see these glass capillaries sticking out of the end of each one embedded in an agar gel, so it's not free swimming, um, is, a lar is a live larval zebrafish. And here's zooming in, here's our capillary, here's our larval zebrafish, which you can hopefully see there. Um, and so we can uh, image, uh, image its guts. Uh, zoomed back a little bit over here. Okay, so we can do that. What does it look like? So I'll show you before um, getting to what we learned from it, a couple of examples. And what you'll see here is, a, is the gut of a zebrafish that was initially germ-free and it's been inoculated just you know, by adding to the water, one species of bacteria. And in this example, and hopefully the video quality is, or the transmission quality is good enough that you can see this. Um, in this example, we're not scanning the sheet, so I'm just staying in one plane and looking at that in real time. What you see is the gut, and each of these little specks is a bacteria. And this particular species is extremely motile. Um, it's sort of the most motile species we know about. It's like a swarm of bees just zipping around in the gut. This is actually one of my favorite movies, and this is what I often think, you know, your picture of your guts should be something like that. Your mental picture of your guts should be something like this. Here's a different species. Some of them are green, some of them are red, but they're actually the, the same bacteria. Uh, and these are all the species that are native to the zebrafish gut, by the way. Here, we're scanning through the gut. So this is a three-dimensional scan. And this species, there are individuals and they're motile, but the vast majority of this bacterial species exists in dense three-dimensional aggregates. So you can see these red and green um, dense colonies here. So we find, and in fact, this was, this was a surprise because nobody had looked at this before, that there is this great variety of bacterial behaviors ranging from very motile to very aggregated. Uh, there's also differences in locations in the gut. So there is a variety to the, um, the physical behaviors that different gut bacterial species have. So two things I won't tell you about are kind of looking more at that characterization of different aggregation behaviors and locations in the gut. And if you're curious, you can see uh, some stuff from us about that. Another thing I won't be telling you about is we've also seen that um, bacteria can actually manipulate that uh, physical environment and things like the peristaltic contractions uh, of their host and use that as a, as a mechanism for invasion and, and that kind of thing. So if you're curious about that, you can uh, see some other stuff from us in previous years. But what I will briefly tell you about is a couple of, of, uh, of recent stories. Okay, so that's the overall setup. And um, we find in lots of things we do, instances of physical processes, whether they're physical processes of the bacteria or physical processes of the, uh, processes of the host, orchestrating the dynamics of these gut microbial systems. So I'll tell you a little bit of things we've done looking at antibiotics and um, host sensing of bacterial behaviors, and then really briefly something a bit more about interactions between species here. And these two things, the first two have been published, one just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the third, we just put out a preprint on a couple of weeks ago. Um, sort of interesting to, to see how it goes. So this antibiotic story um, is especially work from two people, Brandon Schloman, who's a just absolutely phenomenal graduate student in my group, and Travis Wiles, who's an absolutely phenomenal postdoc in the lab of Karen Gillum and our close collaborator on a lot of this. So antibiotics. So antibiotics um, are known from things like sequencing-based studies to induce large changes to the gut microbiome and long-lasting changes as well. And you might think to yourself, this is you know, completely unsurprising because you know, they're antibiotics, they kill bacteria. But the surprising part is that it's known that antibiotics have a big effect on the gut microbiome, even at quite low concentrations, concentrations that are um, far into the sublethal regime. And this is not only puzzling, but it's especially 
um, important because these low concentrations of antibiotics are in fact often found in the environment. So here's a little poll question for you. Let's see if I can get this started. Okay. So there's been a, um, people have worried about things like antibiotics contaminating like rivers and stuff like that. There was a really nice study of, of uh, over 700 rivers worldwide. In what fraction was a, a notable amount of antibiotic contamination found? You can just take your wild guess here. Okay, I'll wait a few more seconds. Three, two, one, stop. Okay. The most common answer is D. The true answer is in fact D, yes. I guess a bunch of people answer D, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so these uh, low levels of antibiotics are actually found quite commonly um, in the environment, which is, which, is a, which is a issue. Stop, good. Okay, so how is it that low levels of antibiotics can have a large impact on the gut microbiome? So we thought, let's take a look. And again, let's take a look in the, in the literal sense. So the experiment um, that we did, again, makes use of the fact that we have this model system that allows us to do very controlled experiments. So we're gonna look at one particular antibiotic, uh, ciprofloxacin, which was in fact actually the most common high-level contaminant found in these, in these rivers and is a very commonly used antibiotic. Um, and what we're gonna look at is just what does that do when you only have one species of bacterium in the gut but our, our one test species, we're going to look at different extremes of potential physical properties. So we're gonna mono-associate our zebrafish with, um, first, this very, very motile species. It's a, it's a vibrio species, it's, it's extremely motile. Uh, and let's see what happens. So the setup is as follows. We have our germ-free fish, we inoculate with, with bacteria, they colonize, develop their, whatever population they might want to develop. And then first, let's not do imaging, but let's just say we're gonna add antibiotic and dissect out the guts and see how much bacteria is there. So uh, if we add a, sub, a weak amount of, of Cipro, this antibiotic, we just look at the concentration in the water, not in the fish. Uh, we have a suppression of growths. So we have a 10 times lower density of bacteria. But in the fish, it's not just 10 times lower, it's 100 times lower. So as has been seen in humans and others, uh, strong effect of weak antibiotics. What's going on? Well, if we look at these bacteria, we find something quite dramatic. And again, hopefully the, the zoom quality works well enough that you can see that our swarm of bees is now a, sounds kind of gross, but a swarm of slugs. Um, this very vigorous motility that we saw before is not there. Instead, we have these bacteria become filamented and elongated, and I'll show you that more in, in just a moment, and become much less motile. Now the consequence of that is that these less motile, filamented, entangled bacteria are much more easily transported by this peristaltic motion of the gut. It's dragging them downstream and eventually ejecting them from the gut, as you see in this movie that takes place over a couple of hours um, below. Okay. So what we end up having is filamentation, loss of motility, and then expulsion of the bacteria from the gut. It turns out they're alive still too, and I'll come back to that later on. So um, in a sense, this is not surprising because it's known in vitro that weak antibiotics typically lead to filamentation and a loss of motility. And here I'm showing you in vitro images, just you know, in a test tube. Um, and this is a consequence of stress responses to these low levels of antibiotics. So basically in the gut, what we're seeing is these, these effects are amplified due to this coupling of aggregation and transport through the gut. So that was what happened when we add the weak antibiotics to a very motile, you know, almost a gas of bacteria. Now, what will the sublethal antibiotics do to a species that's normally aggregated? Now, here again, I thought I'd, I'd um, ask you, take your wild guess. Now, we're gonna do the same experiment, but we're going to um, do this add antibiotic to a species that's normally highly aggregated. In fact, our extreme aggregator, where 99 point something percent of the population exists in big 3D clusters. So what will happen? This will lead to even more bacteria, so an increase in abundance, a decrease but less than the motile species, a similar decrease, or an even greater decrease in the population. Okay. 
Take your wild guess. Three, two, one, stop. Okay. And we have roughly equal votes for um, a weaker or greater increase compared to uh, the very motile one, but a pretty wide range of results. We actually guessed A, that, or sorry, not A, um, uh, B, uh, a, a weaker decrease. But what it turned out happened was the following. We have a thousand fold reduction in this aggregating species. So an even strong, I'm sorry, an even stronger effect on this aggregating species than the non-aggregating one before, which is quite surprising to us. Um, and one of the things I like about this, this field in general is that it's so open um, that you, know, you do these experiments and you're just often surprised, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be. Um, right, so we have an even stronger effect. So what's going on? Well, um, what we noticed when imaging this is, is normally this aggregating species looks uh, like what you see in this upper image. You have aggregation, but there's a quite a wide range of aggregate sizes, um, especially there are small clusters as well as very large ones. With the antibiotic, however, those small clusters are dramatically suppressed by um, over an order of magnitude in, in, their, in, in their number. So this led us actually to a much broader kind of biophysical question, which we kind of puzzled about for, for years even before doing this, but really this forced us to really think more, more carefully about it, which is that, you know, imagine you're an aggregating species. You're in a gut which, you know, is transporting stuff, especially aggregates. How can an aggregating species persist to despite transport? Well, it must be the case that nucleation and growth of new aggregates is crucial to maintaining some kind of a steady state. And here I'm showing you this aggregating species just normally without antibiotics, we have this expulsion of a large aggregate, but there's this steady you know, um, generation of new, new clusters. So that's a very qualitative statement. Can we, can we be more precise about this? Well, what Brandon especially realized um, just on his own and, and you know, really just ran with this is that you know, we, we both stare at these and we realize, okay, there's a couple of key processes that are, that are going on. You can have aggregation of clusters, fragmentation uh, of clusters, uh, growth just from cell division, and this expulsion. So what Brandon realized is, you know, you can write down a, a simple kinetic model for all these. And I won't go into the details because the, the, the time is tight, but you have kind of aggregation and growth, sorry, aggregation and fragmentation of the sort that one often has in like polymer and colloidal physics models coupled to sort of the, the biology, the growth and the expulsion part. And you can model all these, um, you can do analytic things actually, which I won't go into, but also uh, stochastic simulations. And you can realize, okay, you can parameterize these just by a handful of parameters that you can determine actually from other experiments, um, which I'm not gonna go into in detail. But you can put all this together and make a prediction of what the cluster size distribution should be. And I'm probably being told that I have we have two minutes left, perfect. Um, the cluster size distribution should be given those experimentally measured parameters. Then we can go in and actually measure what are the distribution of cluster sizes for these bacteria that we find, and those are the, solid, the dots here. And this matches stunningly well, suggesting that this picture of these processes of aggregation, fragmentation, growth, and so on, are actually um, the relevant ones for determining what does this overall population look like. And what's more, you can go from that to putting together essentially a phase diagram for what should the steady state population of bacteria in the gut be. And in the absence of antibiotics, we have this um, sort of non-zero regime and uh, zero regime as a function of these sorts of parameters. And this aggregating species I've been telling you about occupies nicely this, this um, region where it should exist, but with antibiotics, it gets pushed into this range of the parameter space and can't maintain a steady state population. That was a bit, um, you know, a thin description of, of, of what it is, but nonetheless, the overall point is that these physical processes and their manipulation by the antibiotic seem to be what's governing the overall population dynamics of the system. So, in my remaining minute or so, I think I'm actually going to skip part of this. And just give you a slight glimpse of something very new, where we're gonna we're asking the question, 
okay, that's what one species does. We've looked a bit at like two species, but let's really go beyond this to like, what do multi-species systems do? And um, again, ask questions like, are there rules that govern, you know, the, the assembly of multiple different bacterial species? How does spatial structure matter? Stuff like that. So here, um, actually I'll just I'll skip to the punchline. Uh, this is especially work from Deepika Sundaraman, a graduate student currently in the group, who's, who's really spearheading this kind of intrepid project of asking then, okay, let's do, let's take five species and look at every combination of them, and like pairs uh, and fours and fives and so on. And um, the, the punchline of the story ends up being that um, you, know, you can do this and really put together kind of a rule set of interactions between groups and ask questions like how do these, these um, sort of statistical properties of the, these interactions vary depending on numbers of species. And actually, I should probably just stop now and I'll, I'll leave it for the discussion section if you want to hear uh, more about that story. Okay, so I'll put up the ending. Um, so just to conclude, imaging in a model system tells us things about these in vitro, sorry, in vivo gut microbial population dynamics and tells, them that, tells us that really these physical uh, aspects like the spatial structure of the bacteria and their environment are really actually crucial to understanding the gut microbiome. And more generally, the things we're uncovering are very general uh, properties, both of microbes and the gut environment. So we've been doing these things with zebrafish, but these properties of aggregation, transport, and so on, undoubtedly are there in your guts and so on as well. So I'd like to thank the group. This is our, uh, we had a gathering a couple days ago, and, and here we are all socially distanced in a park. I quite like this picture, even though we're all too small to see. Um, and I'd like to thank the people who have given us um, funding to pursue the, these, uh, uh, these sorts of studies. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll, uh, I'll jump in with a couple of questions uh, 